Hello, my name is Vincent Emanuele, and I am one of the co-founders of Politics, Art, Roots, and Culture, along with my friend, Sergio Kochergin. And we're going to start doing a new series. Um, this particular episode is called My Journey, Radicalized in the Ranks of the Marine Corps. And it's sort of a part one of a multiple-part series that we'll put out that I just kind of wanted to put out there to have. Uh, some of this is going to go into an anthology that I am contributing to uh, later this year. should be out next year in 2022. So I figured it was good to start coming up with at least an outline, sort of explaining to people, you know, how I became politicized. And some of these stories have been told uh, ad nauseum. Uh, to be honest with you, but I don't have them archived in a way that's like uh, concise and cohesive and, and the way that I would want them. So in any case, instead of having this all chopped up in different speeches and articles that I've written over the years and given over the years, it seems to make sense to me to share some of these more intimate stories in this setting. And I particularly enjoy audio, radio, uh, more than staring into a camera. I don't mind it if we're interviewing someone, but I really don't like it if it's just me looking into a camera. So for those of you who are listening on YouTube, I apologize that there's no visuals, but it is much better for me this way, and I think I'll get my thoughts out in a much clearer way through this medium. So in any case, the Marine Corps you know, radicalized within the ranks of the Marine Corps. How did that happen? So, as I've said in the past, you know, I joined the Marine Corps as a senior in high school, you know, confused, didn't know what to do, really couldn't stand going to class at all, hated class, hated every second of it hated sitting in the desks, couldn't stand being captive to that little desk area, stuck in class, listening to teachers that I didn't want to listen to. And Lord knows some of that came, I'm sure, from home, but also a lot of that came from probably just who I was and personality I had. So I, you know, was not interested in school, kindergarten through 12th grade, had trouble the whole way through, bad grades, barely passing classes, barely getting to the next class or to the next grade for that matter. So for me, academics was not really an option. Uh, I didn't have any kind of future in academia and I wasn't interested in any of my studies or any of my classes other than gym class, of course. And I kind of like geography. I still do like geography. Long story short, I think like a lot of young American males, I grew up on a steady diet of Sylvester Stallone movies and Arnold Schwarzenegger movies and Chuck Norris and all the rest. And I've talked about this before, so I don't want to get too much into that. I think a lot of young American men are raised in a certain context and in that context, hyper-masculinity and militarism are glorified. And so it's not surprising when you grow up with plastic guns playing army and cowboys and Indians and cops and robbers and all the rest that you end up glorifying those institutions or supporting them uh, when you get older or end up joining them as I did. So senior year of high school had just fucked around for the last 11 grades, was still fucking around as a senior, taking the most bullshit courses you could possibly imagine, but also found a way to do a cadet teaching program uh, because my guidance counselor was nice enough to allow me to do it, which allowed me to get off campus, well, out of the high school property, for a few hours a day because the way the course was structured or the program, you got to leave we, we were doing something at the time called block scheduling so 
for those of you who remember, it was like really long classes. There was only like three or four classes a day, but they were very long and then they were staggered throughout the week, et cetera. In any case, a few days a week, I got to go to the local elementary school and teach, uh, cadet teach, which is essentially, you know, you function as like an assistant teacher uh, for second graders. And it was fun and I really enjoyed it. Uh, second graders are quite uh, quite the challenge to, you know, keep under control, but it was an interesting program. So I was doing that and I was lifting a lot of weights and doing, you know, going to parties and uh, experimenting sexually and all that kind of stuff. You know, that, that sort of shit high schoolers do, especially seniors. And playing baseball and all the rest. So anyway, I've told some of this in the past, but, you know, I had always enjoyed playing sports as a kid. And as I think about it today, I do think there's a connection there between enjoying being on a team, you know, playing team sports and being in that team atmosphere, and also today enjoying doing political work. And it also, I think, led, at least in part, to my joining the Marine Corps. You know, for me, it was just kind of another collective team to be a part of. Yes, you're an individual, but you're an individual to this sort of greater project. You know, if you're on a team, same thing. No individual is supposed to be more important than the collective body. So I think that did attract me about the Marine Corps. And just to be quite honest, that, you know, you grow up with the sense that joining the Marine Corps sort of makes you uh, tough or look cool all of that kind of stuff. It's so sort of connected to the what I was talking about earlier with hypermasculinity and goofy notions about what is cool and what is not cool. Obviously, there's nothing cool about killing people. Uh, yet, you know, we have like sort of a whole media apparatus that makes it seem cool and then, of course, makes it seem cool in the service of U.S. empire and militarism. And while well, I'm getting ahead of myself, nevertheless... As a senior, this is 2002, so you know, I was a senior in high school when 9-11 happened. Didn't think much of it, to be honest. It didn't think much of it at all until I actually got to boot camp and our drill instructors quickly tuned us in as to what we were about to encounter, which was uh, probably many deployments to, the, to a combat zone somewhere in the Middle East. So we knew that. When we got to boot camp, we knew that going into boot camp, I think anyone who joined the military after 9-11 sort of knew that they were going to war, especially those who joined in the, the first few years after 9-11, as I did, and Sergio and others. So I end up in the Marine Corps. I end up in boot camp, you know, MCRD San Diego. I remember going and getting tested, drug tested, and all the rest. There was like this center that you had to go to uh, where you do all these tests and programs and take your oath. And then you're just awaiting your orders. And then you get your orders to go to boot camp. And as I remember it, I, we like either stayed at a hotel overnight or went to the USO and then got picked up by this bus that then took us to... Uh, San Diego, the Marine Corps Recruit Training Depot, I believe is the name. And when you show up, you hop off the bus and you're on these yellow footprints and you're supposed to place your feet on top of those yellow footprints. And from then on out, you at least as, well, at least I did as an 18 year old, pretty much thought, well, my ass now belongs to the United States military. Great. So, even at that moment, I think I started to have some reservations. You know, what exactly did I get myself into? And everyone, you know, they looked like just ordinary Americans. I don't know why that took me by surprise. I think I did, or at least part of me thought, that most of the people we would serve with would be these, like, very athletic, maybe tall, stoic big, uh, and if even if not, not big, maybe small, but small stature, but that sort of, you know, 
chiseled body and that's what I expected to see. You know, that's why not one of the, one of the reasons why I busted my ass so hard in the summer months leading up to going to boot camp, which was in September of 2002, September 16th to be exact, 2002. In any case, my first impression was I am not impressed. I thought I thought we would be with some like lean mean fighting machines, but that that wasn't quite the case. And I found a lot of the people who were in charge of us were quite incompetent as well. You know, our senior drill instructor was routinely bringing his son into the squad bay where we were staying. And for those of you who don't know what a squad bay is, I'm sure you've seen military movies. Probably most of you have seen Full Metal Jacket. The squad bay is the area where all those bunks are located. You know, so you have all the bunks stacked on top of each other on both sides and then, you know, running parallel across the the length of the of the building of the space, which is called a squad bay. In any case you know, those scenes from my experience, you know, having a senior drill instructor who was bringing his child into the squad bay because his he was having difficulties with his child's mother. So they were arguing and the child ended up in the squad bay where the child did not belong. And he would wake us up in the middle of the night and he would be drunk because we could smell the alcohol on his breath. And he would be telling us stories about, you know, marriage and divorce and trying to raise a kid and all of these just horrific life stories that as an 18 year old, you're just sitting there going, holy shit, is this what life is all about? (laughs) Is Is this what the what? the Marine Corps will drive you to do? Is this what happens after you've spent enough time in the Marine Corps? You know, those were thoughts I was already having in boot camp because some of our leadership was, you know, really having tough time uh, with life and drug addiction, alcohol addiction, all the rest. And I'll get back to that in a second because something ended up happening to that gentleman. I found out many months later. So I also did quite well in boot camp. I found boot camp to be quite easy and that had a lot to do with I think growing up with uh quite an authoritarian disciplinarian type of father. Yet interestingly enough allowed me to do many things that other parents didn't. You know, understood that I was smoking weed in high school and didn't really get too mad at me about it. Just told me to be smart about it, understood we were drinking, understood I was having sex at a young age and treated all of those things in a very mature uh, way, and I always appreciated that. But in many other ways, it was like, you know, get up, make the bed, do your chores, do all the, you know, don't talk back, say please, thank you, yes ma'am, no no, ma'am, yes sir, no sir, you know, shaking hands, mowing lawns, doing things outside, helping the neighbors, working odd jobs. Those were the type of things that he made sure that my, well, at least I did. I'm going to take this opportunity to talk a little shit about my younger brother, who I think got a little more pampered. Uh, But that's a conversation for another day. (laughs) Um, In any case, I think the combination of my growing up with my father and growing up in uh, a sports setting, you know, that ranges from boxing at a young age to Taekwondo to baseball, football, basketball, track. Um, I don't think I did. I swam for a couple of years. Yeah. So I, you know, participated in a lot of different sports and being, a, you know, again, being a part of those teams really prepared me, I think, for in some ways going into the Marine Corps. And then also, of course, physically, uh, which, you know, some people do have problems with. Though I will say that boot camp was a lot more physic it was physically easier than I thought it was going to be. And at the same time difficult because I didn't know that we were going to be running so goddamn much. 
Uh, I always enjoyed lifting weights and sprinting and things like this, but you do a lot of like long distance running in the Marine Corps and you do a lot of hiking. And uh, that was a little bit of a challenge. Mentally, it's a challenge because you're young, you're away from home, you don't have anybody around, you're getting screamed at all the time, you're around a bunch of guys. Everybody's trying to either one up each other or, you know, and that could be fun again in that sort of a way that builds camaraderie and all the rest. But you also, you know, we had guys who committed suicide during boot camp. We had guys who attempted to commit suicide during boot camp. So all of that was going on as well. You could tell that the stress was getting to some people. You could also see that some people really thrived in that environment. And it was interesting because it might not have been the people that you would expect by just looking at them. You know, there were people who, you know, in fact, some of those who thrive the most, I think, were the people uh, who came there extremely overweight or who came there with a chip on their shoulder, who had just got divorced, who had just been kicked out of their home, uh, people who had, uh, you know, just been fired from their job. Those kinds of people really, in some cases, thrived in that setting. It was interesting to see that. And so in boot camp, as I remember it, of course, there was uh, different squads and you're in a platoon and then there's squad leaders. I think there's four or five squad leaders. I want to say four like in a normal platoon. So we'll say four squad leaders and then there's a guide and the guide is like the sort of head recruit. Now everyone in boot camp is called recruits. I should back up and explain the terminology. So everybody's a recruit until you graduate boot camp. You're not a Marine, you're a recruit, and then whatever your last name is. So, you know, I was recruit Emanuele. And out of all these recruits in a platoon, let's say there's 50, 60, 70, whatever the number is, and it whittles down over the 13 and a half weeks that you're in boot camp, there's four of those recruits in a platoon who end up being... uh, squad leaders and then one ends up being a guide and I was the guide for a short period of time until I got really sick and this was two different occasions during boot camp that I got extremely sick one was during a time when everyone got sick because we had a food poisoning outbreak that sort of made its way across the whole base (laughs) which was terrible Uh, all of these guys were standing on line and the squad bay and then everybody just started shitting themselves and throwing up all over the place all at the same time which was quite something uh and totally disgusting people slipping and sliding all over people's shit and piss on the tile floor so that was a beautiful scene from boot camp and another time i just got a horrific fever like 102 103 fever for like three days in a row and so they took away my guide patch it's like a little patch that you put around your arm and then you have the the guide on which is a long pole with a little flag on the end of it and the flag is like the special flag for that particular platoon that you're in so you kind of carry like the flag of the platoon if you're the guide whenever you're running or marching or doing drills or any of that kind of stuff so anyway i'm spending a little too much time talking about boot camp but those were you know, sort of my experiences in boot camp. It's very interestingly enough, of course, it's all it's all structured in a way that maximizes their ability to mold your mind. So when you first get there, you're a total piece of shit, and they treat you like a total piece of shit. And then they slowly build you back up, so they break you down as quickly as they can. You know, they make sure that they shatter the pre-existing identity that you walked in with. So it's, hey, my name is Johnny Smith and I'm a star high school athlete. Well, here you're nobody, Johnny Smith. You're just another fucking piece of shit motherfucker who's going to die on the battlefield. So now you get treated like everybody else. And if you don't like that, we'll make your life a living hell. That's boot camp. And again, some people thrived in that environment. Some people did not. Um, but you know, what is interesting about it is that it was, it's structured in a way to break you down as an individual. So anybody who comes in with individual ideas, this structure will break you down as an individual. 
and then build you back up within the context of this collective body uh, with this uh, focused mission, you know, this mission of war, destruction, etc. The mission of a Marine Corps rifle squad to locate, close with, and destroy the enemy by fire and maneuver, to locate, wait, to locate, close with, and close... To locate, close with, and destroy the enemy by fire and maneuver. To repel the enemy's assault by fire and close combat. Woo! If I would have forgot that, I would have got some shit from some listeners, I'm sure. In any case, that's what uh, that's what boot camp is all about. And then they build you back up. So by the time you get... And here's another thing. This is just a side point for people who think they are going to pick up a weapon and start an insurrection or a revolution in the United States. Um, I, I, uh, I can't take that too seriously because let me say a couple things and it's a nice segue to get into the next phase of my Marine Corps experience, uh, which is the school of infantry. But to back up just a bit, you know, Marine Corps boot camp is 13 and a half weeks long. You don't touch a weapon until week 11 in Marine Corps boot camp. Week 11, you know, so I, it's hard to take people. And by the time you get to week 11, again, they've already had you for almost three months shaping, molding, chiseling away at your mind and your body, creating in their mind and for their purposes uh, the perfect killing machine, someone who doesn't think too much for themselves someone who doesn't ask questions, someone who doesn't question authority, someone who follows orders, and someone who is mission-orientated, you know, and feels responsible to the, to the men to his left and right. Now, I, again, I say men because I didn't serve with women. I just add that caveat. But that's what it's all about, you know. So, and it takes a while to do it. It takes almost you know, again, 13 and a half weeks. And that is in an environment where they have you totally captive within the institution of the Marine Corps. You know, you are captive. You can't, I mean, you can go if you need to or if you want to, but you don't really know that. Once you're there, you don't think you have any rights and they sort of smash it in your mind that if you fuck up and get kicked out or leave, that it's going to leave a paper trail for the rest of your life that will prevent you from getting a good job, getting a good house, et cetera, et cetera. So they lie to you, of course, like any powerful institution does, particularly one that's trying to brainwash you and train you to become a perfect killer. So then you can go fly or be flown, you know, 7,000 miles from home to go kill uh, black and brown peasants uh, who've done absolutely nothing to you or your country. Um, I don't want to, uh, you know, go off on a rant, but that's what it is all about. And so it's frustrating. Anyway, the point I'm making here is that for people who think that it's just easy to pick up a weapon and uh, to work with another group of people, and now, mind you, everyone's carrying weapons that can kill people. You know, machine guns, rocket launchers, grenades, like... One fuck up with one of these types of weapons and you're talking 20, 30, 40 people dead depending on what the weapon is. Let alone just your regular M16 A2 service rifle that we carried at the time. One fuck up with that thing and you can kill one or two people depending on where the bullet goes. You know, so it takes weeks and weeks and weeks of boot camp, 10, 11 weeks, then you finally pick up a weapon then when you get to the range to use the weapon, the atmosphere at the range, still strict, still infused with discipline, but not as crazy as it was two weeks before that, four weeks prior to that, six, seven, eight weeks prior to that, etc. You know, as it moves along, you gain more respect from the leaders. You gain more respect from your superiors. And it builds up your confidence. It builds up your confidence enough, at least in their view, to get you to the next stage of the game, and that's the school of infantry. So, for well, at least for me, if you're in, a, if you are in the infantry, which is like the combat, what they call combat MOSs, uh, 
combat positions, you know, machine gunners, mortarmen, riflemen, uh, tow gunners, so on and so forth. Assault, assault gunners. That's where we, so anyway, end up from boot camp in San Diego to the School of Infantry just north of San Diego in Camp Pendleton, California. And at the School of Infantry, you are once again sort of surprised because you think, hey, I got past boot camp. They're going to start treating me good now. They started treating me good at the end of boot camp. You get to School of Infantry, boom, you're just another piece of shit. (laughs) Right back on the bottom of the totem pole, you are not what they call a field Marine. So, you know, first you're a recruit. Okay, now I'm a Marine. After boot camp, you are you are officially a Marine. Oh, but you're not a full Marine because you have not been stationed at a base yet. You are still in your training mode. So, you know, you're not a field Marine. You're just a, you're still a school of infantry Marine. I don't think they had a specific name for it, but I'd be interested if somebody's listening and they can remember. Um, at the school of infantry, you essentially learn how to become as proficient a killer as possible. That's the goal. Now, the training, I think, could have been a lot better, (laughs) to be quite honest with you. But the goal of the School of Infantry is to give you a little more freedom. So on most weekends, you could kind of go out, you know, if you want to travel to L.A. to the north or if you want to travel to Tijuana to the south or San Diego, you can go to the south and check it out, and I can get into some of those stories though I don't think some of them would be appropriate. But the point is, is the School of Infantry teaches you everything about infantry tactics, field tactics, uh, patrolling, uh, mount training, uh, urban, you know, urban combat training, uh, how to use some explosives, how to fire rocket launchers, how to use grenades, how to shoot machine guns, how to use belt-fed machine guns, how to shoot 203 grenade launchers, so on and so forth. That is what the School of Infantry is all about. It's to teach you uh, how to read maps, how to do logistical planning, all the kind of stuff uh, that you will need to operate in an infantry unit uh, in a combat zone. So that's School of Infantry. Now, what did I learn in the School of Infantry? I learned once again that the people who are in charge of us uh, were a total fucking mess. Uh, So even at that point, you know, came out of boot camp, was critical, didn't quite understand what I had gotten myself into, but already had some reservations, had some questions. By the time I got to the School of Infantry, I thought to myself, Jesus Christ, the people who are in charge of us here are really fucked up. Uh, You know, and the timing was perfect. I got to the School of Infantry in January of 2003, and the School of Infantry is eight weeks long. So the end of those eight weeks brought me to the end of February. And if you were, folks remember, the war in Iraq kicked off on March 19th, 2003. So 19 days before the war started, boom. I was getting out of the School of Infantry and spending time at a place called Camp Margarita in Camp Pendleton awaiting orders to go to I think first we went to Ireland for a layover and then from Ireland to fuel up and then from Ireland to where we got to hang out in the airport for a while uh, and then from Ireland to Kuwait and then uh, on up we went. So that was the sort of first part of my journey. I ended up in Iraq in 2000. Well, I should back up actually for a second. You know, some of the things I did learn and see, not so much during the training uh, during the School of Infantry, but I would say more so on the weekends. You know, it was the first time that we had a little bit of freedom and, you know, working class kid coming from the Midwest. I had never seen anything like the desert in California or the beaches of California or the mountains. You know, this was the landscape itself was amazing to me. I had never really seen anything like it at that point in my life. And of course, all the 
bright lights in big cities of being in Southern California. You know, the highways, the Pacific Coast Highway. And San Diego and all the small little areas surrounding it, you know. And spending time in uh, Tijuana was quite a trip. You know, one of the first times I went to Tijuana was with uh, one of the, gen- actually a gentleman I went to high school with. And he was one of the guys who sort of planted the seed in my brain that joining the Marine Corps was a real option and that I should really think about it. He had already graduated from high school early and had already been in the Marine Corps for a little while by the time I had got to the School of Infantry. So he was already a corporal. I was a lowly PFC, private first class, and he took me to Tijuana for the first time, and we partook in every single thing you could possibly imagine that you partake in in Tijuana. So that means uh, sex at the nightclubs, drugs, alcohol, so on and so forth. Now, It is true we used to get drug tested, but not that often. At that point, to be quite honest, things were so hectic in the military, at least in the Marine Corps, where I was, that it wasn't like we were, you know, people were keeping that close of an eye on us. Plus, also, to be honest, the Marine Corps didn't really want to get rid of anybody at that point. You know, they weren't uh, (laughs) they weren't in the business of turning people down who wanted to go to war and be cannon fodder for Bush and Cheney and Blair's totally bullshit war in Iraq. So, yes, Tijuana. And it was exciting. I mean, you have to, I, you know, one of the things that I think over the years, I don't think I've been maybe honest about, and that is, be not honest, but I haven't been forthcoming about the kind of fun that you have in the military because I'm always trying to get the point across to people that, we shouldn't glorify military service, that we should treat it dead seriously because, you know, the consequences are very serious. It's life or death. So, that said, the reality is the parts of the Marine Corps are totally fun. They're precisely as crazy, you know, wild, unhinged, mad as you could possibly imagine and of course as a 18 year old kid it is exciting to fly through the desert in the middle of the night uh, go through the border of Mexico end up in a strip club or end up at a bar that looks like something out of Desperado or uh, what's the other movie Uh, from dusk till dawn you know minus the uh vampires nobody turned into vampires <laughs> unfortunately that would be kind of cool but anyway um that's what it looks like down there for those of you who've been to Tijuana you know what I'm talking about it's wild it's totally uh, otherworldly experience you know you have drug cartels running around you got biker gang types you got crooked taxi drivers who can get you anything under the sun within five seconds you have um, s- prostitutes uh, approaching you as soon as you cross the border. You have children trying to sell you little trinkets. You have peasants on the street who, or homeless people, or people who might be migrant workers who are, you know, seasonally jumping in and out of work who are trying to sell homemade materials or fruits and trinkets on the side of the road. I mean, this all hits you the moment you cross over this imaginary line we call a border, you know, (laughs) at least there it seems so, Uh, because when you're in southern, southern California, you, you know, the the distinction between southern California and northern Baja, Mexico is, you know, is uh, very, very vague, uh, if it exists at all. Culturally, you know, and through language and so forth, you wouldn't really notice it, um, But it it was a wild experience, and it's something that I would be lying if I said that I didn't enjoy at the time, and I would be lying if I said I didn't learn from it as well. I mean, did I know as an 18-year-old what the fuck was going on? 
uh, in the maquiladoras or the, uh, you know, with the war on drugs or the funding of the CIA, or I'm sorry, the funding of drug cartels and the CIA working with right wing death squads and militias in Central America and South America. No, I, I didn't know about any of that. Um, did I know about the tradition of Marines uh, going down to Tijuana, getting drunk, beating the shit out of locals, stealing money, not paying their tabs, uh, sometimes raping women, uh, so on and so forth? No, I mean, that's not, again, as an 18-year-old who shows up and their friend wants to take you to this place, you don't know those things. So for those of you who want to be critical right away, you know, slow your horses. I learned a lot over the years and read a lot about border towns and what they're all about and how they came about, and the types of things that happened in them. And uh, it's not something that I'm like pounding my chest about, but I do think it's important to just like speak honestly about what those experiences were like at the time for a young kid and why, of course, people are attracted to that kind of stuff and why it's exciting. You know, it's, it is more exciting to go to Tijuana and get drunk at a place that looks like a bar out of a movie that you've seen than to work a minimum wage job somewhere. You know, that's just a fact. So it's like when people ask, oh my God, why would you join the military and spend time in that kind of an institution? Well, in a lot of ways, it's better than doing a lot of shit that people do in this society. At least it's more fun and more exciting. So that was the School of Infantry. Learned just as much on the weekends and talking with these, you know, guys from all over the country. So many different backgrounds. You know, some of them privileged, not too many. You know, most working class, poor. Not much of a future. People jacked up on patriotism and nationalism and all kinds of shit. And then we end up in Iraq. And I'm not going to get too much into that first deployment because I don't think it, there wasn't anything, in my opinion, in from what I saw. Because, again, I was sent home early during that deployment. So we got to Iraq when the war started and left Iraq just a few months later. Just long enough to receive my first sea service deployment medal and was back home by uh, May, June, June. Yeah, because you need three months for the sea service deployment. So back home by June, my mom has a brain aneurysm. I'm sent home from Iraq. She has brain surgery. You know, total mind fuck. I'm in Iraq. Then I'm in Kuwait. Then I'm in Ireland having drinks at a bar, talking to people. All within, you know, 12 hours, 15 hours. Uh, then I'm from Ireland to Chicago, and then I'm standing in Northwestern University Hospital, uh, where you know surgical center, where they're doing brain surgery on my mom. Sitting there in the waiting room with my shaved head and fatigues on, and fleece, and just staring out the window, uh, thinking to myself, "What in the fuck is going on?" Uh, where am I? What am I supposed to do? What's happening? That was Those were my thoughts at the time. Now, fortunately, my mom, you know, made it out of it. But I will say that I think there was a moment in that period that set in in terms of thinking about, you know, death. And I think the whole concept of death for me became a central focus of my life and my reflections and how I think about things uh, from that moment on, you know, going from the war home and then dealing with my mom who was on the verge of death, all of those things, you know, and at the time I was experimenting a lot with mushrooms, you know, psychedelic mushrooms. And I don't want to get too far off into some like hippy dippy bullshit about how it like made me see different realities and all this kind of stuff that that's true to some degree uh, that that is true but what what it really made me do was come to terms with what I was participating in and there was a moment when I was home during that period 
And some of our female friends from high school were going to an all-female university in Rensselaer, Indiana, just south of where we grew up here in northwest Indiana. Well, where we graduate, where I graduated high school from. And we drove down. We had a big bag of mushrooms. I don't know how many, maybe an ounce, ounce and a half. And I proceeded to eat them one after another. I mean, over uh, enough to finish an entire carton of Oreo cookies. So I went, you know, tray by tray, you know, I, those little long slots they have of the trays of uh, Oreos. I went through one by one, eating them with psychedelic mushrooms as we drove, as my friend Griffin, I won't give away any last names, drove down as my friend John uh, was in the back seat. And we're driving down to the university. I'm eating these mushrooms, getting totally blasted out of my mind, but I don't really notice it all at once because... You know, for those of you who've done them, they, they come on slow sometimes. These came on very slow. And even though I was eating, probably because I was eating them steady little by little over a period of time instead of just like whacking them all down at once. So I end up at the university and we end up um, roaming through the dormitory. And I'm like bouncing from room to room and asking these poor women who are just trying to either study or hang out if I could like put CDs on. I had so I had taken a CD out of my friend's car that was the R Kelly remix to Ignition CD and I was forcing people to play this CD over and over again that remix to Ignition hot and fresh out the kitchen like that song I was the only song I wanted to listen to that evening. And I had probably at that point whacked down at least 10 to 14 grams of, of mushrooms. So I was well on my way, uh, to exploring different realities and planes of existence. (laughs) For those of you who've done them before, that's, uh, what Terrence McKenna would call a heroic dose. And so my mind was shattered. My psyche, my ego, my body, my soul, my everything was shattered that night. I spent, A couple hours crying in a bathroom. Uh, It's on the whatever floor of the dorm we were in. And many people were gathered outside of the bathroom. We had locked the door, so we locked ourselves in. Well, I locked myself in, and then my friends John and Griffin came in the bathroom. I started telling them stories about the military and about Iraq, uh, which then turned to all of us crying, which then turned to all of us eventually leaving the bathroom while, you know, a couple dozen women who were, who lived on the floor were standing outside wondering what in the flying fuck was happening in their bathroom on this random, you know, Thursday evening. So long story short, I run into a female, I won't use any names here, and we go into a room to have sex and we're making out. There's like, I don't know if it was a lamp or a couple candles or whatever it was. It was like a faint light on. It wasn't like all the lights on. It was just like some faint light that was in the room. And as she took my shirt off, I had, well, I still have a tattoo on my right arm that says USMC on it. And it's surrounded by like skulls and, with a bulldog that has a gun and he's smashing some of the skulls with his foot and he's holding a bloody knife. And I look at this and it sort of like jumps off my arm and it's like looking at me like these skulls and they're like moving and there's like kind of like this mist that's coming out of them and they're coming off of my arm. And I just, it wasn't like a hysterical, you know, where you're crying, crying, but it was just like tears started to roll down my cheeks. And I looked at my friend and I told her, I don't want to kill anybody for the, I said, I don't want to kill anybody for this. And then that set me off on a multiple hour sort of different trip 
about so the trip changed from like reflecting and being upset and kind of like you know questioning things and questioning why in the hell I'm in the military and whether or not I want to go back to war and all that kind of stuff to like deciding in that moment that I did not want to do this anymore that was a key moment for me it was also a moment that opened me up to more vul- to becoming more vulnerable around other people you know to to sharing what I'm concerned about to sharing uh, my insecurities to sharing fears and to dropping some of the ego. And then, of course, my friends were home from university at that time, and they also played a key role. You know, my friends Mitch and Ben and Chris and Matt, these are people who were at university at the time and came home and were turning me on to all the same things they were learning in their humanities courses, and I'm grateful to this day for that. I will forever be indebted to them for turning me on to that stuff at that time. It was a crucial moment, you know, a crucial moment, and reignited my interest in reading. Now, I was never interested in reading textbooks, but I did always love reading biographies about anybody. Always loved that. And I always loved reading magazines of any kind. And I think at the time it was because my attention span was so short that the article length like magazine article length essays were more up my alley nevertheless I started to read a lot during this period and that opened the door to so many other things but I had to go back to 29 Palms so this is 2003 I'm back in two I'm back in 29 Palms it's the autumn of 2003 and at this point I'm basically drinking a lot of alcohol and having a lot of sex on the weekends and occasionally getting into fights with these other Marines who, you know, people, when you're going out with a bunch of Marines, are always starting fights and doing that kind of shit. Really, when I think about it, I was sort of numbing the pain. I knew I didn't want to be there, but I wasn't confident enough to speak up. I was just starting to read and think read about and think about politics definitely did not have my feet under me. I was you know, 19 now at this time. And there was a lot of decadence at the time. You know, I was for the first time really getting into ecstasy and cocaine and doing them on the weekends. And of course, both of those drugs are sex drugs. So it's like when you're doing those things, they're the kind of things that lead to other behavior promiscuous behavior that can then also be unsafe you know I consider myself extremely fortunate and extremely lucky that I don't have uh, HIV and that I don't have an uh, STD for the rest of my life from you know my behavior during those periods so to the degree that you might hear stories from those periods or I might reflect on them in a funny way or in an irreverent way you know it's only because we, I made it out of those experiences, you know, without an unwanted child or without a uh, STD or HIV or something like this. It could have easily went the other way as well. So, you know, some people get to tell fun stories about promiscuous behavior, uh, doing drugs and so forth. And other people, those kinds of actions, all it takes is one time and it can ruin someone's life. So I try to keep that in mind whenever I reflect on these things. But in any case, back in 29 Palms, we were training to go back to Iraq. We got the word from everyone, hey, we're going back. And everyone was upset. You know, for as much as the Marines today, I remember this clearly. uh, And I think it's part of our history that we should keep in mind. I know it's anecdotal, but I also know it's not uncommon because I've spoken with plenty of veterans, uh, you know, since coming home. And... At the time, you have to remember that the Bush administration, you know, Bush did the whole dog and pony show when he flew in on the aircraft carrier and they unveiled the mission accomplished banner, you know, well ahead ske- well ahead of schedule, <laughs> still launching airstrikes in Iraq. I still have troops in Iraq, including, as Sergio mentioned on our last podcast, the largest embassy in the world. Uh, in the green zone located in 
Iraq. So when they gave us the announcement in the autumn of 2003, it was clear that we were going back to Iraq and probably on multiple occasions, at least those of us whose enlistment contract fit within a certain time period. Some of us ended up going on three deployments. I would have went on three deployments if I didn't refuse to go on a third deployment. So I don't want to get ahead of myself. But all along the way, you know, something I do want to reinforce is that along the way, none of this happened overnight. That this radicalization process took time. You know, it went from, I've got some questions, something's not right, reading something, thinking about something, having some experiences, starting to reflect, engaging in conversations with friends, taking drugs which opened my mind a little bit. Not necessary, obviously. Plenty of people become radicalized, politicized, and a very sophisticated way without ever taking drugs. So I'm not trying to argue that that's necessary. It's just part of my story. And then watching documentaries. And I've told this before, but again, I want to put this out there in a way that I can document it and be happy with. But I will never forget this day because it was simultaneously one of the first days that I ever saw anti-war protesters in person. I remember my friend Vic and Dave and I walking to a movie theater in San Diego. And as we're strolling down the street, it's, you know, kind of sunny out. We're Now we're talking, this is the summer of 2004. So the unit comes back in fall of 2003. We train throughout the fall. Throughout the winter, it turns to 2004. Throughout that spring and early summer, preparing for our deployment back to Iraq and beginning in August of 2004. So it's really hot out and it's sunny and we're walking around San Diego and we get to the movie theater and I had nothing. I mean, knew nothing about Michael Moore, knew nothing about his films and knew very little about what we were about to see. My friend Vic, you know, walks in and, I walk in behind them. We get some popcorn, whatever it is. We got probably some pop. I'm a popcorn fanatic, especially movie theater popcorn loaded with melted butter. So I'm sure that's what I was mowing on. And boom, Fahrenheit 9-11 starts. And I'm not going to go into a full review of the film. Maybe we'll do that in the future. In fact, I should do it in the future. But holy shit, it blew my fucking mind and solidified my belief uh, that, well, it was a belief at the time, now it's a fact that the war in Iraq was going to be a disaster and that I really didn't want anything to do with it. But at that point, what the hell was I going to do? We were two weeks away from deploying a second time. I'm with all my brothers that I had just spent the last year and a half with. What was I going to do? Walk away from them? Run away? No one else was doing it. So I wasn't brave enough to do something like that. And... In hindsight, I don't regret it. Uh, In hindsight, the more time goes on, the more I think that my experiences during that second deployment, while having a profoundly negative impact on me in many ways, also had a profoundly life-changing positive impact on me. And I'm not sure at this point that I would take them away from anything. And I know that sounds contradictory because... It's a war that was unethical, immoral, and illegal. So what a horrific contradiction to have taken away from that immoral, unethical context, life lessons, an attitude and approach to things that have in some ways benefited me while also trying to balance all of the profoundly negative things, uh, negative ramifications of those experiences it's a weird contradiction so nonetheless we end up in al-qaim iraq and so you know we walk out of the i should back up you know we walk out of the movie theater and i called my dad and i told him you know hey i fucked up i know i fucked up and he knew i fucked up and he knew 
because of the news and the war was dragging on and it was clear that Bush was wrong. You know, there wasn't mission accomplished. In fact, the war was just heating up and getting started for real. The insurgency was just digging in its feet. The IEDs, the improvised explosive devices, were starting to be used with some precision and causing some damage uh, to U.S. coalition forces. And people were getting scared. You can tell that people understood this wasn't going to be like 1991. This wasn't going to be a cakewalk. That the insurgency was here to stay. And the fighting was really going to get started. So I think I will leave us at that for today. Uh, Next time around, I will talk about, I don't know, again, how many parts this series is going to be. But I wanted to record enough, at least an hour each time, to, uh, you know, document these experiences. And I hope those of you who are listening enjoy this. I know some of it will be redundant because of previous interviews and conversations we've had. But I wanted these experiences to be recorded in one place. And I figure since we're doing the podcast right now and since we're in the midst of a pandemic, why not record it while we have time? And why not sort of permanently archive this, at least digitally? Someday, hopefully, we can transcribe some of these and have them published in hard copy because I think that's so important in today's world. But for now, we'll have them digitally archived on our website and on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube. And we'll just I'll keep telling these stories. You know, we'll leave off in August of 2004 before our second deployment to Iraq. And part two, I'll talk about Al Qaim, our experiences there, the sort of, you know, oscillation between total carnage, devastation, death, and destruction to the other side of boredom and despair and loneliness and isolation, talk about rules of engagement, torture, some of the horrific things that took place there and why those horrific things played, you know, a huge role in determining how I, uh, my opinion, you know, was solidified being anti-war, being opposed to the war and how those things had a profound impact on me. I think to this day, how I view life and a lot of other things. Uh, because of those experiences. And then I want to talk a little bit about being home on leave, Um, my experiences as an inpatient at the VA mental health facility, which was really like something uh, from One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, but also a period that shaped and formed who I am today, an important period of my time. And then back in 29 Palms, refusing a third deployment, transitioning out of the Marine Corps, and coming back home a confused and angry young man. And then part three, I will start with my journey in the anti-war movement and what my first impressions, experiences, events, and actions were and what I made of sort of progressive left radical politics at the time and what I was learning, what we were doing, what we were thinking in 2006, 7, 8, 9, that kind of thing. So in any case, hope folks enjoyed this. I look forward to continuing the series, and we'll talk to you soon.